Hello everyone, welcome to this rock test webinar. We are delighted to see so many attendees for this pressure meter test webinar. We are confident that your presence will contribute to the interest of the discussion today. Please note that there will be a question period of approximately 15 minutes after the 40, 45 minute presentation. So this webinar will last around 60 minutes in total. During the presentation, you can write your questions in the question box on the right hand side of your screen. We will answer them directly in the chat or we will answer them during the question session after the presentation. Or we will answer them by to you. We will answer you those questions by email. For those of you who are not familiar with RockTest, RockTest was founded in 1967 and is a leading manufacturer of geotechnical and structural health monitoring instruments. RockTest offers a complete line of sensor-based solutions ranging from traditional vibrating wire technology to next generation fiber optic technology. They are used for the measurement and monitoring of geotechnical projects and structural health monitoring of critical assets such as dams, tunnels, mines, buildings, bridges, power plants, and many other structures. So I'm going to give the floor to my colleague Louis Marcil. Louis Marcil <coughs> I'm sorry. Louis is a senior technical advisor at RockTest with over 25 years of practical experience with geotechnical instrumentation and testing equipment. We have mastered various phases of pressure meter testing from equipment development to test result analysis. We has contributed to hundreds of projects providing technical assistance and training and is a recognized pressure meter expert. Uh, Louis is also working on several North American committees to establish standards and best practices. Well, thank you for your attention and enjoy the webinar. Louis? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Olivier, for this introduction. Hello, everyone. So I'm Louis Marcel, and today I'm going to present you the third and last part of this webinar series about pressure meter testing. During the previous sessions, I focused on the pressure meter test performed in soil. In today's session, I will discuss the specific cases of pressure meter and dilatometer tests, but performed in rock. So I will describe the equipment, the execution of the test, and the main elements related to the interpretation and applications of this test in rock. The pressure meter or dilatometer test is a borehole expansion test using a cylindrical probe fitted with a flexible membrane that is pressurized using gas or liquid. So it is a borehole expansion test using a flexible dilatometer or pressure meter. Pressure meters were initially developed for testing soil. Flexible dilatometers were developed in parallel for specific use in rock. Despite a different terminology Pressure meters and flexible dilatometers are equivalent devices to the extent that both consist of a cylindrical probe with a flexible membrane loading the soil or rock radially in a uniform way. Regardless of the terminology used, what is important are the specific characteristics of a given equipment that will make it more suitable for use in soil, soft or hard rock. I will elaborate on this in section two. I have listed here the main standards related to flexible dilatometers. The tests performed in the rock differ from those performed in soil in the following ways. First, the measured radial strains are smaller. 
gen generally well below 1%. We see here two examples of tests. The first one carried out in hard soil and the second one carried out in the relatively soft rock. We can see that in the rock the deformations are smaller while the loading pressures are higher. Also in sound rock, one will generally not reach a shear failure zone as in soil. Therefore, the main purpose of this test is to provide information on the deformability of the rock mass. Contrary to tests performed in soil, those in rock are generally affected by the combined effects of two distinct elements, the intact rock and the discontinuities present in the rock mass. So, during the test, we get a rather elastic response coming mainly from the intact rock which is combined with a rather plastic response coming mainly from the discontinuities in the rock mass. The loading sequence is therefore often different from the one followed for tests in soil, notably by including loading and unloading cycles, which allow to better characterize these elastic plastics, plastic responses. The test will also often be longer in order to better measure the effect of stabilization over time. Another important specificity of this test in rock is the scale effect or the volume involved during the test relative to the structure of the rock mass. It is understood that the larger the volume of rock involved in a test, the more representative it will be of the rock mass as a whole. The dilatometer test normally involves a volume of about 0.1 to 0.2 uh, cubic meter. A final important aspect is the anisotropy of the rock mass. This aspect is often much more significant in rock than in soil. Thus, depending on the orientation of the joints, the modelite measured vertically and horizontally in rock can differ by a factor of up to 10. The effects I just mentioned can therefore be very important in rock. The amount and direction of testing must therefore be established with this in mind. Another specificity of rock testing concerns the equipment. These are generally distinguished from equipment used in soil by their greater sensitivity, their greater capacity and pressure, and by their probes, which are generally larger, which are of the pre-drilled type, and which generally have more limited radial expansion capacity. I would like now to distinguish uh, these types of devices in a little bit uh, more detail, because the type of device chosen and how it is used can have a significant impact on the results. We can distinguish three types of devices, namely the high sensitivity pressure meters, the uh, dilatometer with volume change measurements or volumetric dilatometer, and the uh, dilatometer with radial displacement measurements or radial displacement dilatometer. I have listed here uh, the main manufacturers of pressure meters and dilatometers uh, that can be used to test rock.
Soil pressure meters can be used in Iraq, provided that they have sufficient sensitivity and loading capacities. For instance, already in the 60s, Maynard pressure meters were used in Iraq with good results. However, these devices are not perfectly adapted to tests in Iraq. Their sensitivity and loading capacity are often not sufficient. Their parasitic deformation is often too important. And they are often hardly usable in deep and dry boreholes. Therefore, they can only be considered for use in very soft rock. For more generalized use in, in, the, in the rock, it is better to turn to devices better adapted for this application. So, in this category, we have first the volumetric dilatometers. The model shown here, the Probex, is the most commonly used model in North America. With this model, the deformation of the rock is estimated by measuring the volumetric variation at the probe which eliminates the parasitic deformation of the loading system. This model is a hybrid between a soil pressure meter and a dilatometer. Its standard loading procedure is similar to that of the Menard soil pressure meter, namely by applying a single step loading lasting about 10 minutes but it can also be used following the widespread dilatometer procedure with several cycles and long stabilization periods, but only if the rock is soft. Its main disadvantages are the time required to calibrate the probe, and its use in a hard rock which is more delicate because of the end effects related to its single cell probe. The most common dilatometers outside of North America are radial displacement, the displacement dilatometers. These devices have linear displacement sensors that directly measure the radial expansion of the membrane. At the left, there's an example of a disassembled probe, probe where we see the electrical sensors located in the center of the probe and underneath the membrane and the assembly rings. The main disadvantages related to these devices are firstly that they are a bit fragile. Because of the electronic components in the probe can be damaged if the membrane breaks. Also, the measurement is punctual at the level of the displacement sensors. Therefore, we do not obtain an average deformation over the entire length of the membrane. Finally, the bias resulting from the membrane can be important in harder rock and in poorly calibrated boreholes. To overcome this last problem, uh, some radial displacement dilatometers are equipped with a rigid inserts, with rigid inserts that pass through the flexible membrane at the level of the displacement sensors, thus allowing them to be in direct contact with the rock face. This type of device would, in theory, be the best suited to test hard rock. This image shows this type of device and at the right an example of result generated with this device. So basically, here is what we can remember about the types of devices. First, we have the high sensitivity soil pressure meters, whose use 
should be limited to very soft rock only. Then we have the volumetric dilatometers, which are much better adapted to tests in rock in general. This type of apparatus has many advantages as listed here. However, their use in hard rock requires special precautions. In particular, was, uh, one must follow a loading procedure without cycles, thus essentially producing a first loading modulus value. And then there are the radial displacement dilatometers, which are also better suited for testing uh, in rock in general, especially if the membrane has rigid inserts. These devices have advantages and disadvantages compared to the volumetric dilatometers. I mentioned some of them here. Finally, two general comments that concern all these types of devices. In ROC, uh, one must first pay special attention to the possible effect of the membrane on the results. So a good calibration in a rigid tube is necessary to characterize these effects. Then, another very important element in ROC is the diameter of the borehole which will significantly affect the performance of these devices if it is not well adjusted to the probe. I will discuss this in more detail in the next section. Now, a few words about conducting the test. The steps for a test in rock are the same as those for a test in soil. The first step, step is to prepare the equipment, namely uh, assembling it, saturating it if necessary, and calibrating the probe. Then the test cavity is drilled and the probe is put in place as soon as possible, after which the actual test can be done. Two calibrations are required. The first one, the pressure loss calibration, is to determine the resistance of the membrane. And the second one, the strain loss calibration, is to determine the deformability of the device, which is essentially due to the membrane. The second calibration, which is done by pressurizing the probe in a rigid steel tube, is of great importance for tests in rock and must be carried out and analyzed carefully. Now a few words about the drilling process. The two most important points are the following. Firstly, the diameter of the borehole should be slightly larger than the diameter of the probe and it should be as uniform as possible. Secondly, the level of remolding must be minimal. In general, the borehole will be cored, which will produce good results in sound rock. If the rock mass has altered zones that we want to test, it will sometimes be better to use a roller bit tricone. In cases where the bedrock is of fairly good quality, long drilling passes can be made and testing can be done from the bottom up, which will speed up the process. Note that in the rock it is essential to avoid rock fragments falling on the probe and jamming it in place. Therefore, precautions must be taken as shown in point one, three, and four.
there are different loading methods. The ISO standard uh, 22476-5 uh, proposes four of them. We see here the method A, which is the most uh, common. This method consists in carrying out three progressive cycles of loading and loading, on which we will measure different values of moduli. At each stage, a stabilization period of up to three minutes will be performed. This will result in a test that can last about three hours. On this image, we see a test result obtained with this method in SoftRock. We can notice here that the ratio reload modulus over first loading modulus is around three, which is a quite common value. I mentioned earlier another method that is shorter and similar to the Minard type pressure meter test performed in soil. This method allows a larger number of tests to be performed and this way a, a larger volume of rock to be tested. Here we see examples of tests that were performed in soft to hard rock. The first loading model I obtained range from 0 0.7 to 21 gigapascal. Here we see another case where a single unloading reload so, uh, reloading cycle was performed, which produced a first loading modulus and a reloading modulus. And since the rock tested here is, uh, is very soft, uh, information regarding the mode of failure was also obtained. We're now at the last section of this presentation, which concerns the interpretation and applications. I mentioned earlier that the main purpose of the dilatometer test is to provide information about the deformability of rock. But this test can also provide information on other properties of the rock mass. For example, information about ultimate capacities, creep properties, tensile strength, and in situ stresses. The result from this test can finally be used for rock quality evaluation or classification in general. The deformability of the rock will be quantified using the same parameters as those obtained with the soil pressure meter test, namely with a shear modulus G or a dilatometer modulus E. These moduli can be obtained from different portions of the loading curve, and these ones should be specified. These parameters can be used as inputs for direct design methods, but most of the time they will, they will be used for stress strain numerical analysis and elasticity analysis for applications such as the deformation estimation of the walls and roof of underground excavations such as tunnels and underground power plants, for the design of pressurized pen stocks in rock, for estimating the deformations of the foundations of concrete dams or of the support of bridges or other large structures like arches. And finally, to estimate the lateral deformations of drilled shafts. An important issue in these analyses will be to determine which modulus value to use, 
taking into account the specific stress levels and types of foundations. This is an example of a numerical analysis showing the deformability of rock around a tunnel. The dilatometer test can help to design appropriate support uh, structures of the excavation. For instance, the size of the lining and the necessity of doing or not injection works. It can also help to estimate the effect of the tunnel construction on the surrounding structures. In the case of pressurized penstocks, the test can help to estimate the capacity of the rock to support such a structure without excessive deformations. The direct design method for estimating sediment developed for soils can be extended to the analysis in rocks by using an appropriate rheological alpha coefficient. Again, it is important to take into account the anisotropy and heterogeneity of the rock mass in order to select a representative modulus value. Another field of application concerns the evaluation of lateral deformation of foundations socketed in rock, such as drilled shafts. In these cases, it is possible to develop PY curves using the latometer tests. Different methods have been developed for this purpose. The example here shows a case where the Robertson method was followed. This method consists in converting the, the latometer curves into PY curves by multiplying the pressure by the pile width and the radial expansion by half the pile width. In complex cases, especially if the rock is heterogeneous, numerical simulation methods can be used. It can be useful in some cases where the rock is softer to evaluate its strength in relation to the expected stresses. If the equipment has sufficient loading capacity, this can be done for example, by directly using the limit pressure PL as shown here. This method has already been described in the previous session, so I will refer you to it if necessary. Some, uh, some weak or plastic rocks, uh, oh, yeah. Some weak or plastic rocks such, such as potash, rock salt and oil shale can be uh, very much time dependent to loading. In such cases, it may be relevant to better characterize such uh, behaviors by special long-term creep tests. Tensile failure is another rock characteristic that can be determined in some cases. An example is given here where numerous tests in limestone on the site uh, near Montreal have systematically shown a jump occurring around 8.5 megapascal, resulting from the cracking of the rock. Similarly, it would be possible to determine the brittle brittle behavior of some porous rocks.
Various methods have been suggested to estimate in situ stresses from the latometer tests. These methods include rock fracturing and unloading curve analysis. But personally, I'm not aware of, of a method that would be consistently reliable. However, there's certainly a correlation between the modulus and the in situ stress in rocks at depth, in situations where the latter becomes significant. The latometer tests can also be used to classify rock. A classification can be based on the ratio reload modulus over first loading modulus, which goes from one in a rock mass without discontinuities to three or even five as the level of fracturing increases. The E over PL ratio is also suggested by some as a classification tool. Dilatometer tests can be performed in materials other than rock, such as ice, concrete, and soil cement columns. This was recently done for a reclamation project at the Hong Kong airport, where the latometer tests were used to check the mechanical properties of newly constructed soil cement columns. The formability was estimated from the dilatometer modulus and the strength from the limit pressure. Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about correlations. On this table, I've tried based on a literature review and on my experience to rank order some potential correlations between the dilatometer test and other types of tests or parameters. Note that these correlations generally have a very important scatter or an important scatter. So for example, the ratio between the dilatometer modulus and the modulus obtained in the laboratory can vary from one to five. And there are even rare cases where this value is less than one or at the opposite exceeds 10. The modulus obtained in the laboratory may obviously be greatly affected by the remolding. So these correlations should not be used directly for design purposes. They should only be used for preliminary or general analysis. And here are some specific cases. First, here is a case where we observed a good correlation between the moduli obtained with the pressure, the rock pressure meter and the uh, plate load testing. Second, uh, a case where uh, a mean ratio of three was obtained between laboratory test and uh, probex dilatometer test. This value compares with the average values that we normally observe. And finally, we can see here uh, some comparative results between the, the rock pressure meter and the Goodman Jack. We can see that the results are more or less comparable depending on the interpretation method used for the Goodman Jack. And this concludes and this completes the, uh, the section on interpretation and applications. So I will, I will now conclude by presenting the main disadvantages and advantages of the dilatometer test. First, the disadvantages. 
performing the test is not that easy, of course. So it takes some training and in particular, uh, precautions must be taken to achieve a proper borehole and to uh, limit the risks of equipment failure. Then the scale effects and the heterogeneity uh, of the rock are often more significant than in soil. So it is uh, therefore necessary to take this into account and to adjust the test campaign accordingly. Finally, there are different equipment, test methodologies and interpretation methods to choose from. Which may bring which may bring confusion. And now the advantages. Uh, we can recall that this method is carried out in situ, so uh, it, it can therefore determine properties in situ. So, which is obviously a big advantage. Secondly, the volume involved during the test and especially the ease of repeating the test at several depths in a borehole allow to characterize in a fast and in a rather econom economical way the behavior of rock mass as a whole. Another point to note is that the use of a flexible membrane allows to obtain very representative parameters without having to make uh, complex assumptions that are often hard to verify. So, according to many, these characteristics make this test method the best for determining the deformability of rock mass. And that concludes my webinar series. Uh, so, uh, it concludes my webinar series on pressure meter testing. I hope you have enjoyed it. And now I will pass on to my colleague Olivier for a question period. Um, thank you. Thank you very much, Louis. That was a great presentation. And before we move on to the question uh, period, I would just like to um, inform you for upcoming uh, events that we have on pressure meters. So, uh, on Mar from March 26 to the 29th, uh, Rock Test will be at uh, Geo Congress. So, Rock Test will have a booth uh, in LA. So, if you ever have the chance to go to the uh, Los Santos Convention Center during those dates, please do not hesitate to uh, stop by our booth. You can find out more information at www.geocongress.org. Otherwise, Rock Test is organizing a pressure meter seminar that uh, Louis will actually be um, presenting from uh, June 6th to June 7th of this year. That's in Tampa Bay, Florida. So if you are interested, you can, uh, you can use the link below to, uh, to find more information or uh, you can write to us an email at info at rocktest.com. The email is info at rocktest.com and we will share the information for that uh, seminar that will happen in June this year. So let's uh, open the question period with uh, my colleague René Dubois. René Dubois is the sales director for Rock Test. He's been with the company for almost 20 years now. So um, René, what que questions do you have uh, here? Thank you, Olivier. Thank you, Louis, about the presentation. Yeah, we do have several questions from the, the attendees. The first one, do you suggest the use of a geo camera for selecting which zone to test inside the borehole? Uh, uh, yes, this is a tool that, that can help, if, uh, but it is normally it is not necessary uh, um, because normally the borehole is, is done by coring and you can uh, just by looking at the rock uh, specimens will give a very good idea of the uh, rock. Uh, so, and this will allow to select zones where you want to test and zones that you may want to, to avoid. Uh, so the geo camera is used sometimes. Yeah, if I guess, I guess if you are making the borehole with a, with a, and that you don't have the specimens, if you use a tricone, for instance, 
Azure Camera could help, uh, but I think it is rarely used. Uh, but this this brings me to uh, maybe to uh, an important point is when you when you are doing the the test uh, uh, you you want sometimes you have an interest in trying to test zones that are of softer or of a quality that is not so good uh, but the, if you do so the risk of bursting the membrane will increase so uh, you have to be careful uh, if you uh, if you absolutely want to avoid these zones, the use of a of a of a geo camera, or by uh, by looking at the specimens and making sure that the recovery rate is 100 percent, then normally the risk of bursting the membrane will be very very low. Uh, but you will end up with 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 a with a modulus that will be in a way a bit representative to the. Uh, intact material modulus in a way in situ uh, but if you are willing to test zones that are a bit altered or weathered uh, it's still possible but you have to be very careful you may want you may want to you might have to reduce the, the pressure that you're going to reach during uh, the test to and to look carefully at the shape of the curve to be ready to stop the, the test as soon as, as as soon as they're sign that the membrane might be bulging in 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 a void for instance so that's a long answer but that's it all right thank you we have a few more questions what's the maximum depth we achieve with the with the dilatometer and what do we need to do different when it's very deep it depends on the type of dilatometers that you are using uh, uh, Dilatometers that uses gas, uh, normally you can achieve, uh, you can go deeper, but there might be problem with the, the electrical signal that comes uh, from the probe to the control unit. Uh, but the maximum depth uh, uh, with this system, you may reach 100 and 100 of meters, or even 1,000 meters. So. With, with, the, with the dilatometers that are the volumetric dilatometers where uh, everything is inflated with, with fluids, uh, then uh, it is a little bit more limited. The maximum I've seen was about 400 meters uh, with the Probex, so that's it. Okay, uh, what can you say about testing in non-vertical holes, positive, negative, or issues? Uh, there, I have done it a few times. It, it, it's it's possible, and I think that there was a picture in my presentation that I took uh, during a, a, a test campaign where we for it was for a, a dam construction where where the the borehole was almost horizontal. So so it's 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 quite feasible, uh, uh, especially with the with the uh, probex. Uh, what is important when you do that is uh, it will help if you if you use if you connect the probe to a casing or rods that have the same diameter than than the probe uh, so if everything is flush it's going to be easier to insert and to remove the probe uh, but this can be a concern uh, uh, in these uh, uh, ver uh, these uh, uh, borehole at angle, uh, where where the probe uh, sometimes it will get stuck. Uh, uh, so having a, a casing or a rod that is uh, the same diameter will for sure be something that will help. So yes, doing these these uh, non uh, uh, non vertical tests is something that can be done. Uh, and normally it's not too difficult, but some precautions or some uh, yeah precautions should be taken, of course. I uh, want uh, attendees ask for a good reference of rock dilatometer test in rock. Anything we can provide maybe later on after the presentation? For sure, after the presentation, I can give a lot of of uh, reference because we have several of these. Uh, so that's it. It depends also on for which application or he, this this uh, this attendee could uh, could uh, could specify which which type of application is more 
it's uh, important for him and we can for sure give give him more some references yeah okay let me see uh, how many tests can we do with one membrane average average i would say again it depends on on the type of uh, of uh, of uh, of, uh, of uh, dilatometer that you are using and uh, it depends very much on the experience of of the operator and it depends also on the risks that are you are willing to to take when you are uh, doing this uh, uh, this test if if you are uh, uh, if you want to test as i mentioned earlier you want to test zones that are weathered zones or not quality rock uh, then the risks are more important uh, but we have a reference of uh, uh, per personally I, I have performed over 100 tests we, and I and I, I had a, a membrane failure only once, so it it really it depends. But the the Probex is fitted with a reinforced membrane, a, a really rugged membrane that that uh, will will prevent it or will help reducing the bursting uh, the risk of bursting the membrane. But the risk of bursting the membrane are always there. So <laughs> okay, maybe one we have time for one last maybe. Uh, someone asked about the uh, since the, the the modulus is taken with the radial pressure on the, on the ball in laboratory sometimes it's radio is on the axis of the ball is it a different will have will have an impact on the on the result for the comparison between the laboratory and the dilatometer test. Uh, the 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 direction on which the test is performed. With the during the dilatometer test is is very is really significant is really important uh, when you consider the entire rock mass and I mentioned that that the the modulus if you do one dilatometer test in a vertical hole or in a horizontal hole at, at uh, in the same material that the difference will be really important can be could be really important because of all the discontinuities. So yes, this should be taken into account. And if if you think that if, that there's a that because of the important anisotropy and because of the special orientation of the joints that this will make a difference, uh, you could try to adapt the the direction of the testing. Yes. So what in laboratory, if they do the test, they should do the the same types of tests in the radiology versus the axis of the borrow. Oh, oh, in 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 the lab, uh, you can you can control that a little bit better, but it's going to be only the effect, the anisotropic coming from the effect of the intact rock. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, with the dilatometer. Uh, it's it's the it's the entire rock mass that the anisotropic effect of the entire rock mass that will be very significant. Normally, probably the effects coming from all the joints and are, are more important than the only the anisotropy of the rock specimen. But yes, if you if you install strain gauges in different direction on your rock sample you can have uh, information on that. Okay, maybe two more questions, fairly related. Uh, one asked for if there will be more webinar in the future, and someone else asked about the training about interpretation. So I guess the, the, the seminar, upcoming seminar, would it be one thing that would cover that? Louis? Yes, yes, yes. But uh, we, you see, we, we, we can always be, you, you can contact us directly also if you want, uh, 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 if you want to have more discussion. But normally also you have to keep in mind that uh, rock tests, we are mainly a manufacturer. So uh, normally we don't go too far in the, all the interpretations uh, because uh, mainly it's not our, our job. <laughs> But we can, of course, give a lot of general information. So, uh, and you can contact us uh, directly for for that. Yes. All right. Well, that covers most of the question. The other question that will be uh, will be answered by email uh, after the the seminar in the upcoming days. Oliver. Yes. 
well, thank you everyone for your participation. And uh, if, you, um, if you have any other questions that you think of, or if you need information, again, you can write to us at info at rocktest.com.